Good afternoon. I am the Reverend Dr. William Lewis Rocky Brown III, past master of Franklin Lodge, number 58, Prince Hall, Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, and Grand Chaplain Emeritus. It is my honor and my privilege to participate in this lecture series given by the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. I give honor to God and as well as our Worship Grand Master and to the officers and members of our great fraternity. I'm excited to share with you this afternoon just a few of my thoughts. And the title of my lecture is What Did You Expect of Freemasonry Before You Joined and After You Joined? What did you expect of Freemasonry when you joined? When I started preparing this lecture, I used, I tried to reflect or recollect what I expected of Freemasonry and what induced me to present my petition 37 years ago to Franklin Lodge number 58 in the city of Chester, Pennsylvania. I thought that if I could recollect what induced me to present my petition and what I expected that might indicate to some extent what has introduced others to present their petitions and what they have expected. But first, I wish to tell you a story that may partially answer our question. A young man passed the pawnbroker's shop one day and noticed the pawnbroker standing in front wearing a large, beautiful Masonic emblem on his lapel. The young man passed on for half a block, apparently in thought. Then he turned back, stepped up to the pawnbroker and addressed them saying, I noticed you are wearing a Masonic emblem. I, too, am a Freemason. It happens that I am greatly in need of $25. I shall be able to repay it within 10 days. I know you don't know me, but I wonder whether the fact that you are a Freemason and I am a Freemason is sufficient enough so that you would lend me the money on my personal note. The pawnbroker mentally appraised the young man who was clean cut, neat, and well dressed. And after a few moments thought and agreed to make the loan on the strength of the young man being a Freemason. The two went into the pawn shop where the young man signed the note. He received the $25 and then went on his way. Within a few days, the young man repaid the loan as agreed and that ended the transaction. About four months later, the young man was receiving his inter-apprentice degree. So he wasn't a Freemason when he borrowed the $25 from the pawnbroker. After he had been admitted to the second section of the degree and was placed where all candidates are placed, the young man looked across the room and noted, sitting there, the pawnbroker from whom he had borrowed the $25 several months before on the strength of being a Freemason. His face turned red and he became very nervous. He recollected the, the wisdom that the master had just given him from the ritual about being honest and being a good Mason. And he wondered whether he would have been recognized Apparently not. 
So he planned at first opportunity to leave the lodge room and avoid the pawnbroker. So soon as the lodge was closed, the young man moved quickly from the door to the Tyler's room, but the pawnbroker had recognized him, headed him off, approached him with outreached hand and a smile, and he says, well, I see you weren't a Freemason after all when I lent you the $25. The pawnbroker commented. The blood rushed to the young man's face and he stuttered. No, 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 no. <laughs> I wasn't. But I wish you'd let me explain. I had always heard that Freemasons were charitable and would help a brother in distress. When I passed your pawn shop that morning, I didn't need that $25. But when I saw that Masonic emblem on your uh, collar, I recognized an opportunity to learn whether I would, what I heard about Freemasonry was true. You let me have the money on the strength of my being a Freemason. So I concluded that what I had heard about Freemasonry was true, that they are charitable, that they do aid brothers in distress. That made such a favorable impression on me that I presented my petition to this lodge, and here I am. I trust that this explanation will allow you to forgive me for having lied to you. The pawnbroker responded by saying this, don't let that worry you. I wasn't a Freemason when I let you have the money. I had no business wearing that Masonic emblem which you saw. Another man had just borrowed some money on it. And so it was so pretty that I put it on my lapel for a few moments, but I took it off the minute you left. I didn't want anyone else borrowing $25 on the strength of being a Freemason. When you asked for that $25, I recollected what I had heard about Freemasons, that they were honest, trustworthy, and cared for their obligations properly. It seemed to me that $25 wouldn't be much to pay to learn whether what I had heard about Freemasonry was true. So I lent you the money and you repaid it exactly as you said you would. That convinced me that what I heard about Freemasonry was true. So I presented my petition and I was just a candidate ahead of you. I doubt whether and experience such as these in the story have induced any of you to present your petition to Freemasonry. But it would be interesting to know what did induce you to present your petition? What were you expecting of Freemasonry? The two in the story were induced to present a petition to the Lodge because what they had heard about Freemasonry and by the experiences they had, which confirmed them in the belief that they, what they heard rather, was true. One expected to find men who were charitable and ever ready to extend aid to a needy brother. The other expected to find men who were honest, paid their bills, and were trustworthy. That was what they had heard about Freemasonry. That was what their experiences with each other had led them to believe to be true about Freemasons. After all, did each one of us present our petition largely because of what we had heard about Freemasons and because of a favorable opinion formed from contacts made with those we know as Freemasons or new as Freemasons? And didn't we expect what we had heard about Freemasonry to be true? I know that 
I heard many of things about Freemasons as I was growing up. My grandmother was told me, she said, Rocky, when you get older, this is like when I was in high school and in college, she would say, when you get older, if you can, you ought to join the Freemasons. Because anybody that is anybody in the community is a Freemason. I knew a lot of men who were Freemasons. My father, my grandfather, my uncle and cousins, they were all Freemasons. And I saw how they interacted with one another. I'll never forget one day we were traveling um, to Washington and we were in a cab and apparently the cab driver was a Mason. And my father got in the car, we were all sitting in it. He and my father started talking this language. And before I knew it, he and my father were talking as if they had knew each other for the last 10 to 15 years and they were perfect strangers. And afterwards, I asked my father, how did you know some things that he knew? And how did you all get, we were able to communicate as if you knew each of one another for years, even though you were strangers? My father looked at me and said, son, he was my brother Mason. Today, some of the reasons that we, rec we recollect on our influences to becoming Masons are different from others. Some of you, I hope, had better ones, and possibly some of you had a reason like that of a Scotchman who heard that what you, the more you put in, the more you get out. But the reasons that I re recollect as having influenced me indicate what many might be saying in their minds from whom they receive petitions. And what I expect may indicate what some of those who present petitions expect. I feel certain that certain petitioners are influenced to a great extent by the same reasons that influenced the pawnbroker and the young man to whom he lent the $25. They expect to find men who are ever ready to aid a brother in distress. They expect to find men who are honest, upright, pay their bills, and can be depended upon. Also, they probably are influenced by one or more of the reasons that influenced me. Certainly, they expect to find a high class of men with whom they will be able to associate with. They may be able to find some who, they, who can uh, help them learn how to live a better life. They may be some who wish to make an investment where they will get more out than they put in. No doubt, some are influenced by things told to them by relatives at, that are Freemasons. Yes, unquestionably. Many are influenced by a description of Freemasonry by Masonic fathers, grandfathers, possibly even sons and other relatives, and particularly by what Freemasonry seems to mean in the lives of those who are Masonic. For these and for and from Masonic friends and acquaintances, they learn that Freemasonry is religious, but not a religion. They learn that Freemasonry has beautiful lessons and teachings. They learn that its members come from a high class of persons. They learn that many of the greatest men of history have been Freemasons. Now, all great men in our community are not necessarily Freemasons, but most men who are great have learned to Freemasonry, the part that they need in their life. But they do not have a great deal of information about Freemasons, those who want to come in. They only know what they have heard about it, and they have formed a favorable opinion of it. There's a young man here today in the audience who said he is going to petition himself to be a part of our Masonic fraternity based on things that he heard, and they seem to be favorable based on the things that he told me. You know, many of those who put in their petition may not be able to put into words what they expect. 
but definitely they expect a great deal. Definitely also, we who have preceded them to the altar of Freemasonry encourage them to believe what they believe to be great about Freemasonry. I know that the things I have been told about Freemasonry led me to expect much. And it seems to me that every year I expect more and certainly each year I receive more. This is my second time doing this lecture. 10 years ago, I would have never fathomed myself to have the opportunity to be at the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania giving a lecture about Freemasonry. Now, I have at least partially answered the question as to what petitioners expect of Freemasonry. Now I come to the point then, what does Freemasonry promise us? Freemasonry requires many pledges of us, but what pledge does Freemasonry make to us? And the answer is none. Absolutely none. Nowhere in the ritualistic ceremony is any pledge or promise made. Nowhere except in the historical lectures and in the charges is it even hinted that petitioners or we will receive any of the things we expect of Freemasonry. Yes, the things you and I expected and or the things you and I have led others to believe what we might expect. Yes, many have received all they expected and much, much more. We who like to believe that we have become a part of the fabric of Freemasonry have found the pleasant companionship we expected. We have become associated with men with whom it is a pleasure to be associated with. We have received moral instruction that has meant much to us. We have been led to higher and nobler and better things. We have benefited mentally. We have benefited morally. We have benefited spiritually. We have developed an attitude towards life that has given many hours of pleasure to us. We also have found in Freemasonry the wisdom of the ages and some of the fleeting joys of the moment in a well-balanced program. Millions of others have received what you and I have received. And through the years, many millions more will receive what you and I have received. But you didn't receive those things, and neither did I, sitting around waiting for Freemasonry to bring them to us. You received these things, and so did I, through the discovery that we had promised everything, and Freemasonry had promised nothing. You received these things, and so did I, through the discovery that it was only through our efforts that Freemasonry could measure up to the preconceived ideas that we have. We had of it these ideas, and so because we had these ideas, we realized that they only become true if we make them a reality. Think about it. You received the things that you have received from Freemasonry because of the things that you have done. You have come to the realization, or you should have come to the realization, that Freemasonry as an institution can put out only what we put in. Let me say that again. Freemasonry as an institution can put out only what we put in. It is not an exhaustible warehouse of things we expected. Unless you and I put in, the putting out soon will cease, and it would have been a pleasant discovery to you and I that if you put nothing in, you will get nothing out. 
those brothers who join the lodge that don't get involved with any committee, that don't decide to become an officer in the lodge, will get nothing out. They will get nothing but the title of being a Freemason. We have been enriched by our giving. We have been rewarded through the pleasure of our efforts have provided, we have provided to others. We have been uplifted mentally. We have been uplifted morally. We have been uplifted spiritually through our own efforts to make free racery for others what we expected it to be to ourselves. Freemasonry is a reality because we take the things that we heard about Freemasonry and we make them a reality. Freemasonry as an institution promises nothing, absolutely nothing, as I said. But our petitioners come to us expecting to find an institution which inculcates great moral truths. They come to us expecting to find a great worldwide institution in which every brother is firmly knit with every other brother and developing the best there is in each of us. They come expecting to find mental upliftment. They come expecting to find spiritual upliftment. They come expecting to receive knowledge and instruction. They come expecting to find something that will make them better men and better citizens. They come expecting to find more than they cannot can even describe, rather. Yes, Freemasonry is an institution, or as an institution, has promised its petitioners nothing but each of us as an individual member of this institution has encouraged the beliefs and the hopes which, which petitioners knock at our preparation room door with. If we as individuals Freemasons encourage the hopes and belief with which our petitioners come to us and the same beliefs and hopes that we have, we will learn that Freemasonry is a great institution. Do we not as individuals morally bind ourselves and attempt to provide that which our petitioners have been by us led to expect? We so much want to make those things that were told us such a reality that we do everything we can to make masonry a reality for them. And doesn't the petitioner in turn find himself to attempt to provide for those who follow him into the tiled circle the things he expected for himself? Yes, if each of us and each of those who follow us to the altar of Freemasonry does his part to make Freemasonry what he expected to be for himself, then yes, Freemasonry will be for others all that they expected it to be. Freemasonry as an institution promises nothing, absolutely nothing, but she returns with interest compound interest if we commit all to her care. So I say to you, my brothers, what do you expect or what did you expect to get out of Freemasonry? What are you putting in? In order to get out, you've got to put in. And I can say for my 30-something years of being a Freemason, I've received more than I expected. I have received because I have worked in the lodge. I have received because I decided that one day I wanted to serve my lodge as a worshipful master. I have received because I got involved in our Grand Lodge. And for the last 20 years, I have been a Grand Lodge officer. And because I have put in I have been blessed to give the title of emeritus, meaning that for the rest of my life, I have the title of being a Grand Lodge officer. And I don't have to worry about being appointed 
by the grandmaster each time a new one comes in. So I've gotten so much out of Freemasonry. I've gotten camaraderie. I've gotten support. I have gotten the love of brotherhood. And being one who was, was one of two children and my sibling is a sister, I didn't know about brotherhood until I joined the Masonic family. It's a great way of life. It's a great institution. But that institution is only real unless we make it real. That institution can only live up to the beliefs that people have about it unless we make it a reality. So whether you're that young man who was walking down the street and saw that pawnbroker with the emblem on his lapel and each one wanted to impress the other by living out the rumors they had had about Freemasonry, I challenge you as a brother, are you making free masonry a reality, not only in your life, but in the lives of other brothers? But more than that, are you a symbol of what the rumors are or the things are about Freemasonry? And those things are so great that others have seen you that they want to knock on the door of Freemasonry and petition to become a member. What do you expect to get out of Freemasonry? What are you putting in. You put in nothing, you get nothing out. But if you put in, you will get a lot. Thank you for your time and assistance. It's been my pleasure to share this lecture with you. God bless you and God keep you. This is my prayer. Thank you.